Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our weekly Wednesday webinar with the Property Law Alliance. I hope everyone is doing well this week. And then welcome Bruno and Silna. Uh, how are you guys doing, uh, Silna? <laughs> <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, except for a slight slow internet, I'm sorry everybody for being a bit late. Um, but that's, uh, I think that's that's on me. So sorry, but I'm doing very well. How are you, Madeline? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for asking. And Bruno, how are no, you I'm doing? Good. I'm good. It's same as last week, but but all good. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Um, then we're going to have a bit of a shorter Wednesday webinar this week. We only have time to take one question, um, which I think we can immediately start with. So I'm just going to translate it. It's a question we received in Afrikaans from an agent. So just bear with me. <laughs> do, do it, Marily. Do it. It is in Afrikaans and then we see what happens. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Google Translate. Yeah. yeah. I can't type fast enough. <laughs> so, um, all right. So this agent needs help with the tenant which failed to make payment. So they gave the tenant notice. Um, they proceeded to send a letter to the tenant, giving the tenant seven days to make payment of the arrears. Otherwise, um, they have to vacate the premises within 20 days. Um, the tenant undertook to vacate at the end of October. Um, however, now they are refusing a pre-inspection or to, um, allowing access to the premises for the agent to show the premises to new prospective tenants. She just wants to know what can she do in these circumstances. Um, so Solna, do you maybe want to get started on this one? Yes, uh, Marily, what concerns me, uh, Bruno, I think this is going uh, to be a nice conversation, is th the type of letter that um, the agent is talking about. So I'm again going to tell you from which assumptions I'm working. The fact that there's um, reference to, to this tenant, my first assumption is it's a residential property. And there's reference made to 20 days to vacate, which tells me somewhere um, the agent is aware of the fact that section 14 of the CPA will apply to this lease agreement. Okay, so I've seen a lot of weird letters of demand. And I say weird with a lot of respect um, because I know people are trying to find creative ways of trying to shorten the time period on the 20 business days required by section 14 of the CPA. So the truth is there's no way of getting around that. There's no way of creatively acting outside of legislation. It's as simple as that. It's you only allowed to get to a cancellation on a lease agreement that's governed by section 14 of the CPA by giving the tenant 20 business days to remedy his breach after which you can cancel. So I, I, I've seen letters of demand that says the tenant has seven business days or seven calendar days to pay the full arrears. And if they don't, after that, the contract will be canceled after 20 business days. Okay. Even though I do understand that in total there's then 27 business days, which is more than the 20 business days allowed by the CPA. The problem with this is you're only allowing the tenant seven days to remedy, after which there's then a time period after which automatic cancellation will occur. Now, I'm not happy with that, and not because I'm an unhappy person. It's because that does not comply with, with the law. And if you do your cancellation like that, your cancellation is defective. And the problem is, as much as it sounds like a fab idea to save yourself 20 business days um, somewhere in the beginning, the problem is you will only realize that your cancellation is defective on the day that you are in court with the eviction. I am very sure, Bruno, and I think you can agree with me on this one, I am very sure that there has been evictions that's been granted in magistrate courts on these kind of letters of demand. But at the same time, there's a lot of 
judgments that get granted in error. But if those type of evictions that was granted in error goes on appeal to a higher court, it will definitely be set aside and the owner is going to end up with a major cost order against him after appeal proceedings. Now, I don't mean to sound dramatic, but there's only one way of getting to cancellation if a lease agreement is governed by Section 14 of the CPA, and that is by giving the tenant 20 business days to remedy his breach, after which you can cancel. Now, Bruno, let's have that conversation on automatic cancellation in a letter of demand. So just to put our views in the picture, don't you please want to um, mm -hmm. handle that part, uh, just dealing with mm -hmm. how we get from a tenant that's in breach to a murder letter to cancellation, and then we can discuss automatic cancellation in a letter a little. Um, so it's it's actually quite a it's actually quite an interesting perspective, and I think so. The reality in South Africa is exactly what you said: is people don't try their luck when it comes to situations like this because you don't want to go through a whole eviction process just not to, not being able to finalize it because of a certain time period. So a lot of attorneys' approach is to say, you know what, be prudent. Um, if a minimum, give this amount of time and do it. So we tend to find that we don't always test the law when it comes to certain things. I do absolutely agree with you though. CPA, because there's obviously two schools of thought. So just on what you were chatting about, um, I know that there's some attorneys out there that say CPA doesn't always apply to residential leases. And yes, there are certain circumstances, but few, because a lot of the people that are renting out properties are drawing a profit. Um, and maybe, sorry, profits may be the wrong word because you could still be running a loss, but the bottom line is you're treating it as a business. It's a level of operations. And because you're conducting it as a business, um, the, the Consumer Protection Act will kick in. And even if it's one property that you're treating as your property business, you're going to need to comply with the CPA. CPA is very clear. It doesn't say give seven, then 14, then plus this, then it, it, it's clear. It says, listen, you have to afford them a certain period of time. And there are things in our law that are considered to be substantial compliance. Um, so courts are allowed to delve into a certain set of facts and go, well, even though they didn't use the exact correct wording, was this substantial compliance with the legislation? But again, as attorneys, we don't always take chances like this for clients. When it says 20 days, we do 20 days. And very often if a client approaches us and we've, we, we've got a little bit of doubt, we just say, send it out again. There's no point taking a chance. There's no point taking a chance with it because it says 20 business days, simple as that. Um, in, on the question of automatic cancellation, it's an interesting, it's an interesting argument because I've had it with a couple of people. Now I know that Son and I share the view that especially with residential leases, there needs to be an act of cancellation. Um, but now obviously we start looking at a whole bunch of different things because the wording of the contract is also very important because if the contract implies that there needs to be a subsequent notice or subsequent act of cancellation, then you actually need to, um, um, uh, oblige with that specific term. But what we often find with a lot of other commercial type of agreements, and the conversation here is about how these apply to residential, is if a letter of demand, the contract doesn't say anything that disallows it, and the letter of demand is quite clear that you have 20 business days, and failing to do so almost um, enacts a condition that kicks in at that moment that, that section, uh, that is another section of the letter that says, great, if you fail to pay, consider this to be a cancellation as well. So it would be automatically canceled upon the lapse of 20 days. This term only kicks in after that point. So if you remedy, you're still okay. It's, it's all right. That, that, that cancellation part doesn't kick in. But if you fail, this serves as a cancellation. And it's an interesting debate because commercially speaking, there's nothing wrong with it. But with residential properties, that whole thing of the people get proper notice and you know were their rights really considered and i know that you've got a set views on that uh, um, set views on that Solna. i do and the, i think uh, one of the biggest things for me is bruno our focus as eviction lawyers is obviously to get to an eviction order as quickly as possible yeah. so the, uh, uh, what we do and I know you, you, you share this with me as well, is to separate your potential, 
disputed items. I'm sorry I didn't cough into my elbow, but I'm alone, I promise. Um, <laughs> so I know a lot of people um, are, are a little, now I lost my train of thought, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, we, when, when we do a cancellation and you have a potential dispute, for instance, if your dispute is going to sit in the amount outstanding or in mm. the time of the cancellation, then we try and remove that completely from our eviction applications. So we have a clear line um, straight to your eviction order and the stuff that's potentially in dispute, we can fight about later. That's sort of what we do. So mm. now why I'm bringing this in is when it comes to breach and cancellation, if you acted outside of the terms of the lease agreement or outside of the legislation and legislation, I'm not only talking about the Consumer Protection Act that requires 20 business days. I am also talking about the Rental Housing Act. So in matters where the um, CPA does not apply, the Rental Housing Act still requires a letter of demand seven calendar days before you can cancel the lease agreement. So regardless of under which piece of legislation you're going to fall here, um, just by the way, the CPA supersedes. So if there's a dispute between CPA and Rental Housing Act, CPA will supersede and the 20 business days will apply just for your benefit there. But the most important thing is if you do a sort of creative letter of demand with your seven and then 14 and then 15 days and then on top of that you do three cartwheels and then you get your cancellation it's so confusing and potentially ambiguous especially these creative letters of demand are so ambiguous that your risk of having a dispute just around the content of the uh, the legalities around basic law of contract breach to cancellation so breach to enforcement of a remedy can end up costing you a, a disputed matter, an opposed matter, which will, instead of being finalized in, let's say, three months, mm -hmm. end up being finalized only in a year or more, especially mm -hmm. now with, um, with the court dates being very, very, very <laughs> delayed. I must say, Bruno, um, I know a lot of people want to send a seven-day letter of demand, because then the tenant gets a scrack and they pay the money and everybody is happy because we know that there's a lot of tenants that keep on paying on day 19. Mm. But remember, mm. that's a form of bridge to mm. consistently mm. not pay on the due date is also a form of bridge. So, so if you get to a clever attorney um, that's used to, to these type of problems. Once again, this is, I mean, uh, uh, let's call it spade a spade. This is why mm. specialist attorneys are able to get to the result quicker because this is all we do. Um, I mean, how many uh, residential evictions have you seen in your life? I'm very sure you can't even put a number on it anymore. And, and, and neither can I, because we've seen everything. We've seen the tenants that keep on remedying their breach on day 19. We've seen this and we found ways around it. And so there are a way of placing a tenant on terms that continuously um, remedies breach on day 19. So if there is another solution, why would you risk sending a creative and potentially legally unenforceable or even on a on a soft, not that worst case scenario situation, a letter that is going to delay your eviction. So I think um, the short answer is when section 14 of the CPA applies to a lease agreement, don't try and squeeze the money out of the tenant in seven days and in doing so risk your successful eviction. Mm -hmm. Because the focus must always be on eviction, not on your rental collection. And why I'm saying that is if you focus on your rental collection, you're going to mess up your eviction. Uh, Bruno, um, uh, uh, talk to me about that. I, I, you definitely share my sentiment on that. Mm. No, absolutely. Look, uh, uh, rental collection tends to be an afterthought. So I don't have an issue running it simultaneously sometimes. 
Uh, but again, the focus needs to be on the eviction. So sure, a rental collection can apply some pressure and you know, bring, uh, bring the, the world into reality where the tenant realizes how uh, the consequences of their failure to act. But the reality is uh, a rental collection does not give you an eviction and does not always result in the person moving out. We've had difficult tenants who you can apply as much pressure as you want. But if you're not doing that eviction and you're not applying pressure where you actually try and kick them out, you're shooting yourself in the foot because that just mm -hmm. means they're going to stay there for longer. And the reality is I have a lot of guys that walk in and say, I want to kick them out, but I want all their assets. There's ways of doing that, right? There are ways of doing it. But I've experienced so many times that we go in there, there's a, a specific uh, a section that deals with this. We go in there, the sheriff charges for the trucks and laborers, and you go in there... 5,000, 10,000 Rand, and you find assets that you can only sell for 4,000 Rand. And yes, great. Okay. You've perfected, you've, you've now taken control of your hypothetic. You're going to wait for the default judgment to sell these things. And then what? You've spent more trying to attach them than, um, than what the, the assets are worth. So each, like each person's circumstances um, would necessitate a different approach. But throughout all the circumstances, your eviction still remains top priority because as long as that person's in the property could be 2,000 Rand a month or 25,000 Rand a month, you're losing money on a monthly basis. Rather stop the loss, get rid of the guy, trace him later if you really want to and get somebody else on the property and don't be too, um, too quick to try and retain all the assets because you might lose another 25,000 the next month just because you wasted a little bit of time that yeah cost you, uh, cost you a fortune. I must say the saddest clients I've ever had are the clients that, that believe that, oh, yay, we've attached everything in the property, we've removed it. And then the sheriff's return comes back and there was storage cost, removal cost, sales cost, and I then have to let my client pay in because yeah. the sheriff's account is higher yeah. than what the value of the items were when it was sold. I mean, that makes me sad. And it's not even my money. It's the clients. Yeah, yeah, it, it, I, I advise strongly against that. And I, I'm, I'm glad you share my sentiment it, on and that. It happens, and it happens so, uh, so often because what people also don't factor in is storage costs until date of sale. So we go, great. Our storage costs are what? Like 250 or 350 a day. That's affordable. Not if your sale date is in three months' time. Oh, and guess what? Two months in, there's suddenly an interpleader. So some, some family member comes in and says, no, those assets don't belong to him. They belong to me. You cannot sell them. And now you're stuck trying to deal with it because you can't go, okay, take them back because he doesn't have money to get them back either. So no one collects it. You're stuck with the bill. Um, so it is, it is a bit of a mission. I, would, I, I still do it for specific cases where we've actually done due diligence and we, we've done the maths and we know that it's worth it. Mm. But don't just do it off the bat um, unless you're, unless you're mm. willing to pay those costs and you're willing to take the risk. So I've got clients that do a bulk amount of evictions and they go, you know what? We do Section 32s because in our mind, it's a process that they feel helps out. So whatever, you know what? They've, they've yeah. budgeted for it. It makes sense for them. They know what the risks are. But unless you know what the risks are, uh, be very, very careful on focusing on that over an eviction. Exactly. I've had one very successful uh, residential section 32, but that was about uh, five, six years ago. Yeah. But the tenant had uh, Dolly paintings, two Dolly paintings. Oh, sure. And yeah. I attached that. And I mean, imagine a Dolly painting on a sheriff auction, it's going to go for five rand. People's going to be yes. like, what's wrong with the elephant? Um, yeah, yeah, wow, the clock's melting. So, but it How was actually- How did the sheriff uh, price it? How did the sheriff- No, uh, uh, so, uh, 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 we've attached, and I, I can't remember what was on the inventory, but the poor tenant had 75 heart attacks and paid quickly. But so if I have one extremely successful residential, Section 32 story. Um, I'm, I'm on, uh, there's, yeah, and there, there's a few others, but I mean, there's only like this few extremely successful ones. And I think the point is, if you try and focus on rental collection, be it on 
uh, perfecting your hypersec, be it on the, trying to, to shorten the time period for payment, uh, you need to focus on your eviction every mm. single time. I think, Marily, what I find interesting about the question is they now refer to the tenant agree to vacate at the end of October. So there I'm happy. So I just want to, to, to set this agent's mind at ease. If the tenant now agrees to vacate, it means we sit with a sort of a mutual cancellation. But Bruno and I have said this, excuse my little Latin here, but ad nauseum, that if you... <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long Wednesday. <laughs> so, but, um, if you agree with the tenant to vacate on a specific date, please just get that into writing. Um, because what I would like to see this agent do is not just agree to the, the date on which they, they will vacate on that. Remember, we have still, as part of the uh, TPN rent recovery pack, which is free for all users, we do have an agreement to vacate. But we've said like a million times, remember, even if a tenant signs that, we still need to follow the eviction process. But because the parties agree, your chances of the tenant actually vacating is pretty good. But what's very important here to appreciate is now there's a door to confirm in writing that the tenant and the landlord agrees to cancellation of the lease agreement. Because my concern with this particular case is I'm not happy with that letter of demand and I'm potentially not happy with the cancellation. So my recommendation would be quickly talk to an attorney and get the correct letter out to confirm the mutual cancellation. Because if the tenant then doesn't vacate, which I'm suspecting they're not going to, hey Bruno, I'm, I have an eviction. Oh, yeah. 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 We have these feelings. I know it's a weird thing. But you can throw any fact sheet to Bruno or I, and I promise you, we will on 92% of the times agree on our gut feel on will the tenant stay or will the tenant go? Because there's, uh, I think it's my experience, you see how they react. And this tenant that doesn't want to allow access, mm, exactly. you're going to have to evict. So you, it's now the 14th of October. Yeah. We still have half of October to get our ducks in a row so we can commence that eviction on the 1st of November. Um, I'm, I am a little worried about this one that's going to turn into an eviction, but we can do the right letters. We can't commence eviction yet um, because there's an agreement to vacate, but we can commence then on the 1st of November. Uh, but but letters of demand, seriously, we've, we've talked about system generated letters of demand this is an agent so the chances of them anyway using like the tpn um system or paper or whatever is pretty much close to 100 percent. so why use weird creative letters if they are well tested well used letters available to your to your disposal at a really fraction of the cost yeah absolutely um and uh, maybe just for uh, the um the benefit of the person that asked the question, it, exactly what Silma said. The problem is going to go, trying to go to court now, based on these circumstances, presuming that the tenant's not going to vacate, is going to be difficult. Um, and the suggestion that you get them to sign a cancellation, uh, to sign something, is so important because that mutual cancellation will save it all. It's you've got a proper cancellation in place. You don't need to worry about anything else. You've kind of fixed the problem. So sometimes what I suggest with clients is this is where you can entice people to sign it. There's always something. And tenants, tenants will agree with this. Tenants won't always see the bigger picture. So if there's a reason or a need for him to sign it and you can get him to see that need. And I know it's a weird thing, but, and be careful with this. But for example, even... A, even a, a certain discount on arrears, if you really believe you're not going to be able to collect it, sometimes you can actually entice and saying, if you do move out, we'll actually give you X percent off. It'll come back if you stay on the property, 
but if you do move out, we'll give you X percent off. And there's some enticement to get these people mm. out the property. You can do this eviction without without necessarily having an attorney. Just make sure the attorney knows what you're doing to make sure that it, it's actually enforceable. But the reality is there's ways of doing it. Now, you, there you need to think outside the box, but follow the letter of the law insofar as taking that outside of the box thinking and making sure that you formalize it. So when we do go to court, if we go to court, that we've actually got a case that we can make out and we don't need to juggle and confuse magistrates about cancellation periods and this letter followed by this letter. It's the same thing, multiple letters of demand over the same debt and people just keep sending out letters that keep changing. It confuses magistrates. Like you want to try get it right at least the second time. Like if you don't get it right the first time, just get it right the second time because as soon as it starts getting confusing and amounts start changing and one month it's higher, one month you correct it and it's lower, you have different parties. The more manual um, intensity you put behind it, the, the larger the opportunity for mistakes. And it's happened plenty of times where a person then uses a letter of demand, but they refer to one of the other properties. And now it's a problem because now you have a tenant who's trying to be sneaky and saying, oh, well, you were referring to another property. I didn't even know that this was for me or something stupid like that. Just mm -hmm. get it right once off, send it out and, and you're good with it. And this is a golden opportunity to just get them to acknowledge that they're going to move out and that the, the agreement's mutually canceled. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I think that was a very clear answer. Um, all right. So this is about the time that we have this evening. Um, I just have one uh -huh. thing. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I just did one. I'm sorry. I know it's the 14th of October. So tomorrow, uh, theoretically, the, the national state of disaster will lapse. And I know it, all our viewers are on the edge of their seats on that one. Um, I actually just uh, got the uh, government gazette notice, so it was gazetted. An extension uh, was gazetted until the 15th of November. I'm sorry, that's why I put my hand up, because I actually <laughs> got the notification just now. Um, so so the, it was gazetted, the extension. So we are still in a national state of disaster. Yay, disastrous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so it's uh, it's still the way it is. And I think why it's relevant, especially for our viewers, is like on the rent recovery packs and those things, um, uh, repayment um, only commence after the, the lapse of the national state of disaster or if those agreements are cancelled. Um, look at your, at your agreements that you've concluded during lockdown. Um, and see what is fair. Remember, as part of the lockdown regulations, there is mm. still a requirement for landlord and tenant to communicate and come to a form of agreement. So please, please do that. It, please don't sit there and, and wonder what you have to do. Um, Bruno and I and our firms are, are there to serve the industry. Pick up the phone, mm. call mm. us, ask the question, um, I, I can't talk for you, Bruno, but we typically won't charge someone just for a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 so I won't talk, uh, talk for you, but I, I'm quite sure. Um, no, if you have a question, yeah, pass it to Bruno, pass it to me. Um, we are more and than happy. Why, to have yeah, and that's why we have Property Law Alliance and a lot of the platforms that we are on, because obviously sometimes it's not easy getting 50 emails with 50 small little questions. That starts becoming hard to manage. Yeah. but. We've got these platforms. So if you have yes. something to ask, ask it, and we're more than happy to talk about it. It's 100%. what we do. <laughs> uh, exactly. And if you don't ask us those questions, then we have nothing to talk about on a Wednesday. And then we need to start, you know, handing out sourdough recipes. <laughs> <laughs> but so that was my extra 10 cents. Now I'll keep quiet. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for that, Solna. Um, I think it's very important for our viewers. And then, yes, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. And thank you, Solna and Bruno, for joining me. Um, and have a lovely rest of your evening. You too, Marley. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.